advised him again to relay via radio to the office just precisely what we had and uh, advising him again to close off the area. I took the shotgun then and I came up through here and I got over this railing here and assuming this was one of the exits that they would use and I was here maybe three or four minutes and the, the whole group of hostages and suspects with the exception of one went out through this door here. And they How had, many were there? Uh, in the group I would say there were six or seven, something of this nature. Uh, How'd uh, they do that? And I couldn't use a weapon because the judge and uh, everybody was mixed up in the group. And as they got out here, then this other uh, pushy hair, light haired one came out. He had the automatic weapon. It was a carbine AR type weapon. And he came out, and about this time, the one that had the gun on Judge Haley turned around and saw me. And he says, kill that mother. He says, kill him, kill him, kill him. And he came out this door, and he put the gun right on me, and we were standing there facing each other, and he's still in line with this group. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to kill you. And uh, so I dropped down behind here, and uh, I had just had my head sticking over the top there. And he says, come out. He said, I'm going to kill you. And, well, uh, and he says, I want the gun. He says, bring me the gun. So I came over the rail, and I got up to him, and he said, lay it at my feet. And I laid the gun at his feet, and uh, he said, now I'm going to kill you. And so I had my hands up, and I started to back away. And I got about here, and then something distracted him in this area over here. And the ones who were holding the hostages started yelling, and uh, uh, I couldn't make out really what it was. I was more interested in my position at the time. And... Uh, so this guy momentarily turned mm -hmm. to back to this other group that was to his left, and I started backing up with my hands up, and I got down here where I could get in between these cars. side of the courtroom saw a tall, light-complected Negro with bushy hair pointing a handgun at the back of the neck of Lieutenant Dixon of San Quentin Correctional Force. Uh, everybody hit the floor except some of the lady jurors. Uh, this stranger came forward and passed the handgun to the defendant, McLean, who put the gun on Judge Haley. from the bag, a large bag, an automatic rifle, covered all the correctional personnel, and at gunpoint, they were forced to unshackle the witness McGee, who had been on the witness stand. McGee was then armed too, and I think it was McGee who was sent to the holding cell to liberate the three remaining witnesses who were under guard in the holding cell. At, uh, during this time, uh, Judge Haley called Sheriff Montanus by phone, and uh, the defendant, McLean, was at his side while the telephone call was being made. The judge said, we have four dangerous men in the courtroom, fully armed, and they have the courtroom under subjection. We do not want any interference, any interference here at this time in order that we do not jeopardize any lives. There are still a great many loose ends and a great deal of speculation about what happened here. Investigators will now try to determine if there was a conspiracy of some kind that involved perhaps more persons than those who actually participated in the bloody event. Investigators say militant organizations such as the Black Panther Party will be high on the list of inquiry.
the suspect that was on the stand got up, walked over to one of the San Quentin guards, who by this time were all lying on the ground. How many of the guards were there? There were five. Five guards in the room, yeah. And uh, told one of them to get up. Uh, I think his, the suspect's name was McKenna, or the one that was testifying was McKenna. He said, uh, you've held me in San Quentin for X number of years. Uh, I was unjustly accused. Uh, now, for the love of God, take these cuffs off of me. I want to be a free man. There was discussion about taking the two older women, myself, and the baby that was in the courtroom. They uh, abducted a young couple walking by outside with a small child about 18 months old. And uh, McClain uh, kept saying, leave the bailiff alone. He's all right. Uh, right. They started using piano wire on some of the people. I don't know how many. Uh, the judge told him everything would be all right. They called the sheriff. They talked to the sheriff. Who called the sheriff? The judge called the sheriff. Talked to the sheriff. himself? Right. And McLean got on the um, uh, got on the phone and told the sheriff to call all those dog pigs off, or uh, they were going to kill everybody in the courtroom. They had an automatic weapon, and he just opened up, and he could listen to it. to know if it's there was. I'm saying that there was no conspiracy, that Jonathan, a 17-year-old man-child, was working according to the dictates of his own mind. In fact, in fact, I'm, 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 I'm convinced that everybody around him was making a tremendous effort to clip his wings, slow him down. I think most people saw that, that thing building in it. A loss of confidence, loss of faith in the processes that were going on, the court appearances and the Salinas, and the way we were being treated. I tried not to uh, emphasize the foul treatment when he was around. But, uh, yeah. Well, it seems to you, then, that this is something that it took a long time for Jonathan to come to the point he reached last Friday. It built over a period of time. We built up over a period of time. Seeing, uh, seeing the processes there in Salinas, Campbell, and Brazil, I think enough to shatter anybody's faith. After sitting for, I guess, since February, watching Judge Campbell shake his head no and conspire with the prosecutor to send them to, to the gas chambers, how could anyone who's ever sat in that courtroom think that anybody would get justice? I don't see how anybody can expect it. Not if you're black and poor. Do you think that's what Jonathan was thinking? I think that's what he was thinking. 
I know he was very depressed about the way that the courts were. My son, my son Jonathan had a lot of faith in the way the courts were until George came up to the courts. We all had faith in the courts. You know, there are many black people in this country who have faith in the courts. They believe they can get justice. I used to believe it myself, but not anymore. What happens to George now? What, what do you expect? I don't know what will happen to George. I hope that people, people who think and people who try to realize what's been going on, and many people who have been going down to Salinas know, know what has been going on. I tried to get out. Uh, I went to school, program, but now on the side, I was studying uh, things that I felt that would help the community. My personal opinion of what the black community needs, uh, officials didn't feel that uh, the things that I was doing, the things that I was saying, were uh, the type of things they wanted in the street. Well, why we gather the rest of the specific word of James Jackson last week as he discussed I think it can be said that the prisoners show definitely the following signs of some bodily injury. Contusions, some abrasions, some lacerations. There were those who suffered from uh, one fracture of the fourth metacarpal bone of the right hand and according to the warden's testimony this fracture was acquired prior to the events of last saturday there were no signs of injuries that could be as recent as having occurred in the last 36 hours this i believe is a objective statement of my findings as one interested in a medical statement of conditions as I observed at the institution. I'm a lay person, I'm not a physician, but there were contusions, there were bruises. Uh, uh, it was obvious that, uh, you know, some uh, that, that people had been struck, there was no question about that. Rochelle McGee hurt. Uh, Rochelle McGee is one of the people that uh, also has bruises and, and continue to prove today 43 new positions for San Quentin. And this, the, they're to be utilized at the discretion of the, uh, in terms of new programming that'll go on here too. And I can't describe that to you other than, uh, than uh, it'll be evolved over a period of time with the input from the staff as to make this place safe. And the warden is free to use those 43 positions. And we did this through, uh, uh, and, and they came to me at, by uh, by virtue of the staff and the employees groups and the employees all along the line, suggesting that's an, that's the amount of staff under the new program it will take to make this place safe. Was there, Have there been any resignation? Resignation on behalf. Of I don't think there was a real threat. But we got some of the damnedest people you ever seen in your life working in corrections, and they got plenty of guts. So some of them resigning. I don't fault them for resigning. A lot of people were talking about it, and I don't blame them for talking about it. But in the final analysis, they're not going to abandon in the ship when it's uh, rocking a little bit.